Feature this week is Peter Lin, born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Taiwanese American jazz trombonist Peter Lin has been described by Downbeat Magazine as solid, fluid, and smooth. He is also the band leader of the Lintet and TNT Quartet. As a featured soloist and sideman, Peter has performed with world class jazz artists, including. Slide Hampton, Steve Davis, Rufus Reed, Victor Lewis, Kenny Barron, Wynard Harper, Charlie Persip, Wayne Escoffrey, Jonathan Blake, Josh Evans, Kenny Davis, Steve Williams, Anthony Nelson Jr., and many, many others. You can find him and his music at Peter Lynn, that's P E T E R L I N dot bandcamp.com. Facebook.com slash the Lintet, that's L I N T E T. Instagram, the underscore Lintet, L I N T E T. And YouTube.com forward slash user forward slash P H L music 815. Another really exciting project Peter's involved in is Yardbird Entertainment. Right now, they are bringing live jazz to all of us via their live streams from around the New York metro area. I've actually watched one of their live streams, and it was so cool. It was <laughs> not to be missed. It's it's the new frontier for sure of uh, what, what we're looking for from music. Um, and you can catch their live jazz at Yardbird Ent. That's Y A. R D B I R D E N T dot com, yardbird and dot com. Peter, how you doing today? Good. Thank you so much for that great intro, Dan. That's Yo, a... <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah, it makes it sound better uh, when you say it. <laughs> Man. Oh, for sure. So, like I said in your intro, you're a trombonist. Would you describe the trombone as your primary? musical instrument yes most definitely um you know it's the instrument i've been playing since i was in fourth grade and um play professionally for i would say it's definitely been over 10 years now i i lose count after 10 <laughs> yeah for sure i hear you well once you hit that decade mark you're like, well it's been over a decade how long has it been <laughs> to <laughs> talk to me at the 20 year point we'll change it to two decades cool so at the moment uh, and I know this might be a hard one to pin down, but do you currently have a favorite song or a piece of music at the moment? It might just be today. It might be something you heard this morning. What's like number one top of mind? Wow. The no wow. That's that's really hard, man. <laughs> so maybe not favorite, but maybe what's the most recent piece of music you heard that you really just dug and you're like, yes, this this just does it for me. Man, I've been trying to check out some newer music. Actually, you know what? It was the newest uh, uh, and then, and then uh, release. Uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, Nat, uh, his newest music video. Um, it, he basically dropped this album where it was a surprise album. No one knew that it was going to drop. And um, man, he still got it. You know, I used to listen to him in, uh, in high school. And like the, even, even the newest stuff is just really, really good. His rhyme schemes, his... Um, just the way that he's able to uh, kind of use play on words quite a bit, you know, a lot of puns and stuff like that. Like, it's it's amazing, you know. So, uh, mad props to him for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Well, th thanks for uh, turning me on to that for sure. And I'm sure everyone else who's listening to this is going to go Google that right after this podcast. Oh, that's great. G N A T. G N A T. Cool. Yeah. We'll check yeah. it out. Shout out to Nat. Awesome. Um, what's your favorite book? on music. Now, this could be a method book. This could be a biography of a musician. What's your favorite book on music? Man, I've read like a lot of jazz musician bios, but mm. uh, to be honest, my favorite one is the Dizzy Gillespie one, which is to be or not to bop. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, which was like a classic line that he, he would use a lot uh, when someone would talk about bebop. Um, and it's more of an autobiography. Uh, I'm sure he had some help, you know, um, assisting and, and putting it together, of course. But, um, you know, for the most part, that is probably the most in-depth and probably the most honest autobiography uh, that I more recently read, you know. Um, 
so, sometimes it can be hard to straddle between biography, autobiography, and then like sometimes just the people helping to put it together might add things that might or might not be true. You know, in, in Dizzy's case, it's very, uh, it feels very genuine to to Dizzy and just the way that he talks about the scene and um, yeah, that probably best one I've read more recently. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Now, how about your favorite or one that you heard recently that you really liked, Film Score? Whoa, Film Score. Actually, I've been checking out The Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. and, Dude, um, that yeah. music is good. Man, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. Like, usually I don't like Disney-fied things, you know? Um, this is not that. Cool. Yeah, no, no. Like they, they did a horrible job on, you know, continuing the seven, eight, not, you know, for, for in my opinion. But Mandalorian actually makes up for that, I think. You know. Um, yeah, just the music in there is is really it keeps true to the essence of Star Wars. And I just thought it was, you know, <laughs> it was great. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you noticed, did you watch the last episode that came out? Uh you mean the well i've been checking out the season i'm not too sure if i'm done yet oh okay i, I checked out was jedi the the one where the, there's actually a ahsoka jedi. yeah yeah Ahsoka. cool um in the last episode listen to the music because there's actually an easter egg in the music earlier on in the episode that tells you what's going to happen at the end it's wild. I'm not going to oh, give it away. I'm not going to spoil it. Oh, but if you listen very carefully to the score, there's actually an Easter egg in the score. Oh anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's super cool. I caught it and I was like, what is about to happen? Yeah. Oh, cool. So, Peter, you've actually put out a couple albums. The first album you put out was called With Respect. And what what was really cool about this album is you actually combined uh, some of your Taiwanese heritage with the jazz that you've learned. Um, could you talk a little bit about the process of combining your your heritage, your sort of um, cult, the culture of your heritage with the culture of jazz, what that overlap looked like? which pieces you took from which to really create this sort of new vibe? Yeah, definitely. So um, with respect was a combination of actually, so my wife is Chinese mm. and she comes from uh, more of the northeast part of China, Donbei. It's called that whole area. And she was the one that suggested about half of the tunes on there because, um, you know, the, the reason that I want to do this whole thing of combining like Chinese and Taiwanese, uh, you know, folk music with in, inside the jazz context was so I could bring the two communities more together. Um, I felt like there wasn't that many, you know, Ty in Taiwan and in China, like, jazz exists there's definitely like clubs and whatnot but there just wasn't um kind of that middle ground where someone could just come in and and understand from a from their own perspective like you know how to understand the music and how to connect so i i just felt like this was a good way of um helping that community but also my own family to understand like what's going on inside the music so uh, just starting from that basis, that, that was kind of like the motivational factor of why I wanted to uh, put this all together. Now, in terms of the music itself, um, I grew up in a Taiwanese household. Um, my parents are from Taiwan. Uh, you know, they came here for graduate school. And so, you know, I was born here in, as you mentioned, uh, Bon Rouge, Louisiana. And then I grew up in New Jersey. And when I was growing up, my parents would like to hang out with their own friends and have this karaoke night. It was kind of just <laughs> Saturday nights. I just remember very vividly. Um, we would go over. It was kind of like a church activity. You know, um, uh, Taiwanese churches are very similar to, I don't know if you're familiar with like a Korean Christian church uh, kind of family oriented uh, activity, but... <laughs> It's very popular uh, within certain Asia, East Asian communities to have like 
uh, not only church be a religious thing, but also as a community thing, like meeting other Korean uh, people or meeting other Taiwanese people. So um, anyway, getting back to the uh, karaoke nights. Uh, so Saturday nights go over friend's house. You know, we would the kids would just do their own thing. But then the parents would, you know, drink a little bit and uh, like to sing a lot of the classic kind of Taiwanese and Chinese songs from, I would say, you know, between the 20s and like the 80s, you know, like a big span of time. And um, if anyone heard the music, they'd be like, wow, I'm <laughs> this is a different whole different world to me. It's It's definitely like very pop oriented very it just sounds very old school and uh but the melodies are just very distinct i mean it's it's definitely hard to not remember them and not to internalize some aspects of them um so you know i i drew from that kind of uh you know those memories and just that feeling of the melody and try to find a way to meld it within the jazz context. And a lot of times I found that uh, the music is actually, uh, is very conducive to being able to uh, apply a lot of the jazz, I guess you want to say chords and improv uh, kind of uh, layout and put that, put the melodies of the classic Taiwanese and Chinese songs and, and combine the two things together. So, so on that point, Peter, when you're saying you're combining the um, the melodies, so are you talking about a classic jazz format for a song? So we're going to have the melody at the beginning or the head, then that's going to be followed by improvisation of the musicians over the same chords or improvised iterations of the chords that the melody was on. And then we're going to end it by restating the melody we did at the beginning. Correct. Yeah. Right. And, th and definitely there was a lot of arranging going on at that time as well um that was helping to not only create that but also um create a whole different vibe in terms of the rhythm in terms of the uh the way you're presenting the melody so a lot of times i would draw inspiration from the stuff i was listening to at the time like for example one of the songs is uh based off of uh cedar walton's um oh uh, what, what is the name of that song uh i'm not sure uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like trying to try and remember the name of the song. But anyway, uh, you know, I, I would take inspiration from those songs like a vamp or like, you know, uh, that kind of um, uh, style and then put the melody on top as an oversoaring thing. And so sometimes I would do the arrangements that way rather than just sticking to a traditional like, OK, A, A, B, A form or something like that. Um, and then solos and then head out. <laughs> But, you know, having a combination of those things was uh, helpful in, in putting that all together. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds really like a fascinating, it's almost like a collage where you're taking pieces of the of the Taiwanese and Chinese songs and then putting them in. I actually do have a question for you about the uh, song you had on that uh, evening, Primrose. Oh, yes. At the very end, it like turns into a cha-cha and I was wondering... <laughs> I was wondering why. I mean, it sounds cool. Don't get me wrong. But just like, what was the inspiration behind that? Why did you head in that direction? So that's actually uh, from the original. So that song in particular is actually from uh, Shanghai. And basically what was happening during that time that it was created, uh, this is back in like the 30s, um, is that there was actually a, a big jazz influence. Uh, because, you know, at that time, there was more Western influence coming into China in some way or form. And part of the things that they bring over from, you know, America is definitely the music. Well, and also so at that time, sorry to interrupt you, but at that time, it's also important to understand for people that jazz was pop music and that exactly. the, the songs that were coming out of the music theater plays were getting turned into improvisational jazz. And they themselves, the actual music theater songs like Al Jolson and all them, that was actually the pop music of the time. That is correct. And that's exactly what um, they were drawing inspiration from in terms of when they created their own songs. So that song in particular is actually from 
like old Shanghai, like um, kind of uh, theater. Yeah, kind of like a theater kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. And so that cha cha thing at the end is actually part of the song, the original song. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought it would be kind of funny to like end it that way, a similar way, and also as a way to um, make it more familiar with like the community that understands the music or at least know where it comes from. Um, I've been finding that the closer I stick to the original melody and form, definitely the higher possibility that <laughs> they will recognize it themselves. You know, I, I don't think I've performed these songs for like, uh, you know, I actually did almost like a mini tour of these songs within um, New Jersey, New York uh, networks, where basically I would play for a bunch of different Asian organizations, whether it be Taiwanese, most of them were Taiwanese organizations. Um, but there were like people that were not familiar with jazz at all. And so um, they would come up to me uh, being more like, yeah, thank you so much for playing those songs. I haven't heard those songs since blah, blah, blah. Right. But then when I would play these in a jazz context, then those would be like more jazz listeners. And then they would come up to me and be like, wow, I, was, was that a, a song like um, that uh, is from the Great American Songbook or something, you know, because it, it just has so, so many, so many similar aspects to it. Um, so it's just funny how like those two different communities would come to me and <laughs> say how they relate to it. But uh, yeah, and that's actually executing on your original purpose, which was to bridge the divide between those two communities, essentially, and then also the, the Taiwanese community and jazz. That's right. That is yeah. correct. Yeah. Really, yeah. really cool. So on this project, it was an album project. I believe there was eight tracks on the album. Yes, I believe so. <laughs> yeah, eight tracks. So starting from the very first note that you wrote of the first song to when it's actually released, how long did it take you? Oh, man. Um, I would say that it would... That probably took me half a year mm. i think well you know i didn't intend to build an album at first you know for the first album i don't it's interesting I, I wonder how many people intend to really do their first album with all the music on there like pre preemptively i'm i don't know what like <laughs> um i know personally i wasn't necessarily being like oh i want to make an album and i made all these songs mm. right like it was almost more like, hey, I want to like, have these songs so that I can um, you know, try to book gigs with this particular set of music. And then over time, it was like, man, why don't I just create an album with this? Because you know, this is, I have enough material at this point. So it's, it's hard to pinpoint uh, how many months you know, since writing that first arrangement, right? Um, but I do remember it, you know, it happens very quickly once you have all the material mm. because just the mad and especially after you've done a couple of gigs because then it's just like well let's just bring the band to the studio and, and get this recorded and at that point i think we had done enough gigs with that particular set of music um to be able to execute it well you know inside the studio it didn't take that much um time we did it all in one day you know which <laughs> i try not to do anymore uh, but you know, sometimes that's all you can afford too. Um, yeah, studios charge per hour. Usually that's <laughs> pretty pricey as an independent musician. Um, so yeah, I, I would say six months is probably the amount of time for that. Something that really struck me about the album and now hearing you talk about bringing the band in is that there was a lot of tunes where like a flute was featured on the first one. I think there was a guitar in on the fourth or fifth mm -hmm. tune on the album. And I mean, when you're out playing, did you have these guys just sort of sit in for one song? And for listeners who don't understand what sitting in is, it's where you're not in the band per se. You're just kind of going to play a couple songs with the band as an invited guest. So what was the actual band configuration like? when you were out playing and then when you went to the studio, what did you add on or change? <laughs> That's a great question. So um, 
usually the lintet itself is actually just five people. Mm. It would be me, uh, the tenor saxophone player who usually doubles on flute, mm. um, and then piano, bass, and drums. Mm-hmm. So that would be uh, usually the rhythm section at that time was mostly uh, Ben Rubens, a uh, great bass player, Oscar Williams the second piano player, and then Nick Cachopo, the drummer. And so um, that, and then the tenor saxophone has switched over the years in, in many ways. But, uh, you know, originally it was Benjamin Kovacs, who I had met through William Patterson. Um, so that's usually the core of the band. But in terms of the album, what I wanted to do was I also wanted to be a culmination of my uh, experiences leading me up to that point of making the first album. And for me, it was really about that jam session aspect. That's kind of like how I was, you know, you want to say like raised in the music preliminary, uh, especially when I was in uh, William Patterson for my undergraduate studies. I would go out to these jam sessions quite a bit and meet all these great musicians and then be able to network and, you know, gig that way. So for sure. And let's actually pause there and explain what a jam session is Uh, for anyone who doesn't understand the concept of this. So basically we're going to get in between uh, on a rough night, maybe three on a good night, maybe 30, um, a mix of amateur professional musicians, all ages, all skill levels, many different instruments. Uh, and in the case of jazz, all coming together to play a particular set of songs, which are called jazz standards, which everyone knows in between, let's say one and a hundred of these off their head. Um, and because everyone knows the same songs, they're able to come together and jam. So these songs are structured in the way that we actually described your music being structured. So we play the melody of the song at the beginning, then uh, the instrumentalists who are playing take turns playing a solo, and then at the end, to finish it up, you play the melody again. So it's like a melody sandwich with a whole bunch of awesome music and jazz exploration in the middle of it. Yeah, that is correct. Yes, um, so you know, jam sessions are... uh in my opinion, one of the vital uh, lifelines of of jazz in in general that is is kind of the continuation of what's been happening since the beginning, uh, passing down this oral tradition. And so uh, jam sessions is kind of the place where you learn how to uh, play with others, um, but also, you know, be able to cultivate your skills. And so so I had met Winard Harper, who's a fantastic drummer um uh that toured the world played with everyone um i i want him to be on the album so he's on two of the tracks and just adds such a vibe to them uh he's on rose rose i love you and he's also on uh my blues which i guess we'll get to later it's not <laughs> that one is not uh Taiwanese or chinese uh folk song uh but it's one of slide hampton's original compositions mm. that i had the honor of um uh, be able to play on that album. Um, so yeah, I have Winnar Harper on one of, you know, two of the tracks playing drums. Uh, I had James Zolar, who's a fantastic trumpet player in Harlem, um, who in my opinion should be getting more, uh, attention, but he, he's been, um, yeah, he, he actually was featured with the Lincoln center, maybe a couple years ago, um, and he he's just a fantastic plunger player as well. Um, he's got such a good vibe on that. So he's playing on Rose, Rose, I Love You as well. Um, so Peter, yeah. can you actually clarify two things for listeners? Number one, what do you mean by oral tradition and how are you spelling oral? And two, what does it mean to be a plunger player and which instruments can include a plunger to modify or modulate their sound? Yes, of course. Uh, so the R O I'm speaking of is A U R A L, so uh, meaning learning by ear, in this case. So, in terms of how jam, you know, in terms of jazz being an oral tradition, uh, what I mean by that is uh, a lot of, in terms of how professional or in terms of how jazz musicians are able to cultivate their skills. Um, 
it was, you know, everyone knows that you can go to music school for jazz now, you know, but uh, back in the day, that was not the case. And learning was basically, uh, you know, the streets. So basically, uh, what a lot of musicians would do is they would go to these jam sessions um, and try to sit in with like, you know, these uh, more established musicians that's been playing for longer periods of time and have a lot of the tradition ingrained in them. And if they can't keep up on stage, uh, you know, usually they would let you know <laughs> on stage very quickly that you can't keep up with them and not by words, but by music like oh let's play this song oh you don't know the song okay well yeah and we're gonna try. play it this fast you know, one two a one two three four and all of a sudden you're going help <laughs> <laughs> like this is normal and then they just prove to you that this is normal right and so you go back home you try to work on those skills you know work on that song work on playing through certain chords trying to navigate and learn how to improvise in a more meaningful way and you come back the next time and you, you try to do better, you know? Um, For sure, and, and I think it's also important to clarify that when we talk about going to school to learn jazz, that that does not preclude the needed work of following that oral tradition. Correct. Because you, you can go to jazz school, I mean, you can go to university and get a degree in jazz and really not be that great of a player when you come out. It's really up to you to go listen to the records, transcribe the solos. So transcribing means you're hearing the solo a great jazz musician or even your friend has played, and then you're copying those notes exactly on your instrument. So I, yeah. think, I think it's also important to understand that even though they do offer degrees in jazz, it still is an oral tradition. There's, there's no way around that, and you're not gonna be a player sort of worth your salt unless you actually sit down and do that work. Yeah, and I, a lot of it has to do with uh, community as well. You mm. know? Uh, where has the music come from and do we understand the culture that of uh, which has come from? And you know, I'm not afraid to say that this is a black music, you know, jazz is a black music in terms Yeah, mm -hmm. and, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the originators, where it comes from um, and to be able to go out into the community and to um, you know play for people, but also be able to communicate with musicians of um, different eras and different generations, and be able to learn from that. I mean, this this music is still conducive of that. So uh, yes, you can go to <laughs> a college where maybe all the profess professors are not necessarily musicians you know, by trade, maybe they're a lot of time, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, you're going to find that in certain schools, um, the professors that they hire are, are mostly just people that have degrees and don't necessarily have the experience of playing in real situations with like a lot of these masters that we consider to be jazz masters, you know. Um, so uh, I, I definitely would not be where I am today, unless I had um, yeah, like if I hadn't gone out to a lot of these uh, jam sessions and a lot of to these concerts and I try to really be involved in the community as much as possible. For me, it's really about community at the end of the day. That's what makes jazz jazz. Indeed. And yeah. could you clarify what plunger playing is? Plunger playing, yes. <laughs> so um, it it's very... Uh, it sounds exactly what it, what it is. Basically, um, anyone that's uh, you know has a plunger at home, you basically take. So this is a toilet that, plunger we're talking about. This yeah, is the, the bottom plunger. half, the actual rubber part of a toilet plunger. Correct. Which typically, typically not the fancy one too. Just like the the half half a circle. Exactly. Yes, ha ha half a sphere. Excuse me, hollowed out on the inside, red. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> exactly. You you basically take. <laughs> The end of that, um, which apparently is very hard to find at Home Depot uh, <laughs> <laughs> nowadays. People apparently don't use the plunger anymore. Um, and what you do, uh, this, this kind of tradition within the music where basically you take this plunger, you hold it in your hand, and um, you play with it so that it you get more kind of like vocal sounds out of it. And what you do is you 
you move the plunger, um, I would like to say on and off the the horn, the bell of the horn. So where the sound is exiting the coming out the horn. So this could be any horn. This could be a trombone, a trumpet. If we got a big enough one, we could do it on a tuba. <laughs> exactly. Right. On, on any instrument that has like a, a horn that with the open end, you know. Um, I never had to explain plunger playing before. Um, <laughs> That's and, the first time for everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but there's a tradition where, yeah, basically you're moving this plunger uh, on and off the end of the bell and you're creating different sounds with it. And it's actually very similar to a Wawa pedal. Yes, exactly. We're more familiar with that, um, where you get a very vocal uh, effect by doing so. So we're yes. modulating, when we're covering it up, we're stopping the higher frequencies of the sound from escaping. And then when we're opening it up, we're modulating the amount of higher frequencies we're allowing to escape from the horn. And that's how we change the sound. Same principle yeah. as a wah pedal. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and it's, it's actually a great tool to have on you at all times. Uh, I've, de I've definitely been told that like, you know, okay, you play trombone. Yeah, we get it. But you got to have these other tools in your arsenal to mm. also be able to change the sound. Mutes, uh, mutes, that's one kind of mute. Uh, when we say mutes, it's uh, referring to, um, I guess, like objects that you could put inside the bell to create different sounds. That would be a more simple way of putting it. Change the frequencies of the sound. Um, so and these that, could be anything. Like we, we could yeah. throw a beanie baby in the bell. It would <laughs> serve correct. as a mute. That is correct. Um, I, I found different things that I could put on the end of the bell myself. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just create different effects, make it more interesting, uh, get yeah, get more into that for sure. Super so. cool. So going back to with respect, um, where did you record the album? So I recorded this album at Tedesco Studios which is located here in Jersey. In Paramus, uh, right? In Paramus, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, Tom Tedesco is uh, he's a fantastic um, engineer. He's been doing this for a long time. I mean, he's he's recording basically like every day. <laughs> and the studio um, itself is beautiful. Like it's all wood. It's like half of yes. their house, I think, is basically. is the studio. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite an experience to go in there for sure. Oh, most definitely. And uh, it's, it's it's always a pleasure knowing that like so many other people and professionals and people you look up to have entered that room and recorded there. Uh, I just remember he would set up a Tom would set up a mic for me. He's like this same one that Steve Davis used. Mm. He's a very famous uh, jazz trombonist. And so uh, I was like, perfect. You know, like, <laughs> I'll have that one, please. <laughs> I just hope I just sound, you know, anything close to that. Mm. <laughs> So um, it's it's always nice working with Tom over there. Oh, for sure. Now, did you record your next album there as well? Uh, next album is called New Age Old Ways. Also, eight tracks on this album, eight songs. Uh, did you record this also at Tedesco Studios? Yes, I did, but in a different way, actually. That one was recorded in a more live setting, meaning that we actually had everyone in one room. Mm-hmm. Um, I just feel more comfortable that way. And so did the tenor saxophone player, who's a very great established uh, jazz artist himself, J.D. Allen. Um, and But with, with respect was recorded where we're all in isolated booths, meaning we're all in different rooms recording into a mic. Um, and that feels a little bit more disconnected for me. Uh, so yeah, I, I just wanted to try it where we were all in one room. Yeah, my my main takeaway from listening to that album is it sounded like you're in sort of the front row of a jazz club yes. with like maybe not so many people in the room because it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a live sound to the yeah. recording. Like the room had a little bit of an echo to it, so like there wasn't yeah. too much in the room um, to sort of soften the sound. Yeah. Uh, but something really struck me going from your first album to your second album, and that was you got simpler on the second album. So there wasn't a lot of big arrangements. The instrumentation was just a quartet, the entire album. Um, but there was this really raw energy that had this confidence to it that I didn't hear on your first album. You first album, and don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking your first album, I'm saying just looking at your progression as an artist. 
from your first album to the second album, you can hear the confidence in that second album of, and I mean, the musicians you picked to play on it were perfect. The drummer, was that Nick again? Uh, yes, it was Nick Achopo again. Yes. Was- Listen, like the energy <laughs> that man brings to the tracks, he just makes the space. He's like setting the canvas mm-hmm. for everyone else to just blow on. And oh, by the way, when we see when we say blow in between jazz musicians, we're talking about playing, but playing. we're inferring like a certain amount of grit and gusto and energy and oomph to that playing. So if you're gonna blow, you're like, yeah, he's gonna play. <laughs> um, right. Even on the ballads. On that tune, I think there was one ballad or two on the album. Um, mm-hmm. There was still this underlying current of it just had teeth in a, in in this really sort of bare bones kind of way that I really really dug. And I actually do have a question for you because I know your first album which we could argue was much more produced. It sounded a lot more what we would think of commercially as being polished. Commercially. Yes. Not artistically, Correct. but commercially as mm-hmm. being polished. That you saw a lot of success in terms of getting on college radio charts, um, getting brought out by a lot of uh, Taiwanese organizations to play. You saw a lot of commercial success on that one. What did you see in terms of commercial reception for your second album? Yeah, for the second album, you know, the the primary purpose of that one was actually just the fact that I was kind of in a different headspace at that point. Mm. Too. I think, you know, with the first album, I was definitely more in the line of, hey, I want to put out this album for trying to get some more, um, I guess, like, you know, just on the very <laughs> primal uh, reasoning, just try to get s- some more uh, traction with my own career mm. by trying to put out this first album. And I actually had Anthony Nelson Jr. help me produce that one. Oh, cool. In particular. So he, he had very good ideas in terms of trying to be able to get it some radio play and do it this amount of time. And, you know, right. very, like, as you say, it's, your insights are completely correct. Like, it's, it's uh, very produced on, on the first one. And well, so, I mean, it, for for a for, for a first a, for a first attempt at a jazz record, it is it is somewhat produced. It's not like there's you know two hundred tracks and like, but it it still is more commercially yeah. produced, commercially polished. Well, and again, just for the listeners, it's it's important to understand the difference between when I say commercial and artistic. Commercial, we can judge. Uh, album's performance based on its reception and based on how much it sells. But we're not actually talking about the art or the intention or how it makes you feel, which all is arguably more important. But anyway, carry on. Right, right. Yeah, I'll just put it this way. My first album is easier to put at the beginning of a podcast (laughs) than my second album is, you know. Um, And, you know, I think for New Age Old Ways, my primary intent was so I could showcase more of the A, playing of the Mm. band, but also B, uh, be able to showcase a lot of the original songs that I was um, I, I was composing a lot at that time. And I just wanted to be able to highlight a lot of those compositions and and try to find ways to um, yeah get myself out there more as uh, a composer and a arranger of sorts, you know. Um, and so that was that was kind of the you know primary reasoning behind that one. But I also had J D. Allen just give a lot of great. I mean, just having him in the band, it, it didn't really feel like he was in the band. It, it, in in like in the way of like okay. Uh, I'm hiring him and he just comes to place. It wasn't like that at all. You know, we're all like really good friends. You know, we just talk so much over the phone about just so many different aspects of life. And um, his philosophy definitely rubs off on me um, in such a positive way. And so when when it came to the album, uh, he did have a lot of great ideas to bring to the table in terms of like how we're going to approach playing on these albums and how are we going to approach these compositions. Um, so, you know, I definitely want to give him credit for just 
<laughs> having such great insights on uh, my compositions and obviously playing on them just gives me insights on how these compositions are formed in the first place. Um, and I think but, to your point of speaking about how on this album you were really trying to showcase more the musicianship and the songwriting. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really struck me was listening to, especially the, my feeling is like the head for New Age Old Ways, the song, where yeah. you guys are actually trading yeah. off melody notes to go through yeah. it, but it sounds and feels cohesive, is kind of like this little summary of the dynamic on the album and like you said it didn't sound like there was a quote-unquote hired gun on the album it really sounded like you guys have been playing together for a while but i think like you said in the process of creating the album having these conversations having these dialogues where you're understanding people on a human level can actually bring you to a more intimate place for the jazz music conversation that happens afterwards. That's correct. Yeah, we're we're more just being more honest with each other mm. helps be more open mm. in the musical setting. Mm. And so you're everyone, you know, it's almost like we're not used to being vulnerable as a lot of jazz musicians. It's like we like to think that we're um, have a hard skin and, and and whatnot. But at the end of the day, like the more open and honest you are with the other musicians, uh, the more that can come out. Just uh, I guess genuinely, you know, uh, inside the music, because now you feel more um, compelled to express yourself without the fear of being judged. You mm. know, and so I think JD was a very good proponent in trying to get that feeling from everyone. You know, I, I would come in very like professional, be like, okay, we're going to do this and and that. <laughs> he would just like break it up with like some other you know, talk and I'd be like, oh yeah, this is, that's important too. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I didn't even, um, process it that way, but it made us all feel more like, okay, we can just go in there and play, you know? Mm. And he, he's that kind of player himself. Like if you check out his trio albums, he, he loves doing things without a chord, uh, instrument. And so actually at that time, so did I, you know, um, I was just hearing a lot of, uh, uh Ornette Coleman, Mm. Um, it was a very, yeah mm -hmm. who, uh, an audience doesn't know he's a very um famous uh saxophonist from the 60s um really coming from the 50s but uh more popularized in the 60s where he kind of broke the um kind of the mainstream at that time uh popular i guess underground jazz thing where it was less about the um traditional format of like playing a song, improvising it and whatnot. Um, he still had some aspects of that, but he would try to improvise in a different way. He thought about music in a different way. And so it created a little bit more of an ethereal kind of feeling to the music rather than something that was, you know, quote unquote, straight ahead. Yeah, we and, could actually call that avant-garde. So he avant was actually one of the leaders of the avant-garde movement. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the principles would be instead of... Instead of trying to cohesively create something that we talked about and planned ahead of time. So we talked about these jazz musicians knowing these jazz standard songs. So instead of everyone knowing the same song, everyone gets in a room and someone's like, okay, go. And then there's no plan. No one's saying the tempo we're going to play at. No one's going to say the speed. No one's going to say the key. We're all just going to listen to each other and kind of make it up as we go along and feed off each other and have a conversation in that way. Would you say that's about an accurate summary? Um, yeah, certain avant-garde musicians. I would say that Ornette was a little bit more in line with the tradition in terms of the way that he thought about um, his music. So actually, there are some recording tapes of Ornette's rehearsals on youtube <laughs> so, someone just released these like tapes and he would be talking to the drummer be like no you gotta like play you know i, ne I never heard these things before but it just sheds so much light on how he thinks about the music but he would tell the drummer like no i don't want you feel it that way i want i want you feel it like this and he would describe it in very concrete 
like um not necessarily musical terms right in philosophical terms so he's producing yeah but he also had like a a method about thinking about harmony Mm. um i'm trying to remember the name of the uh particular style of harmony that he he would uh think about it but it was it was very specific and very individualized for him and uh and his band members so uh for him it was more about the dynamics of feeling each other in that uh in those spaces uh within certain uh criteria Mm. so i I feel like that's a much different approach than maybe certain other avant-garde musicians at the time where it's like hey let's just go up there and and play (laughs) and then not you know whatever comes out comes out you know what i mean that's Mm. that's a lot um that's a whole different uh, ball game because you know that's coming <laughs> from Charlie Parker. Mm-hmm. That you know when you hear his lines and stuff like that. I mean, it's all like <laughs> Charlie Parker. <laughs> like if you took each individual line, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's the line. You know, that's that's something that comes from Charlie Parker's vocabulary, meaning uh, stuff that he's played before, mm-hmm. and then he replays it in a new light. And so that's why I really respect about uh, Ornette Coleman. It's like it's uh, it still has that tradition in it. But it also feels really free. It really feels uh, like you know he can just freely express himself within that context. And so I wanted to uh, recreate that experience uh, within these uh, compositions that I was creating. You know, most of it was uh, in the traditional head, you know, <laughs> solos and then head out. But um, I also had a, a a vibe in my mind, like, okay, we're going to try to think about these songs in, in this way and it actually came with a comic book so I, I already had like an image about what these songs mm. mean yeah which really helped uh when i was creating these compositions so you you actually had the the peter lynn method where you were you were uh you you were taking an image and actually composing from an image and trying to capture an image artistically in sound so do you think that it might be fair to say that your first album satisfied the need to have your art and have your voice be accepted? And then the second album satisfied your need to further that voice and bring it to a place where artistically you were at that at that time as you grew and as you evolved that artistically you're like yeah okay this is where i'm at right now and even if it doesn't get radio play like that's okay because i'm making this for me and this is something i feel in my soul that i am meant to do yeah most definitely and uh, and also the other thing is um i think it's really hard for uh i think i think when most people look at me and they, they say that i'm a or like I, I try to explain to them that I'm like a musician or a jazz musician of sorts. Um, sometimes the stereotypes of like, uh, well, you're Asian, so you must play um, piano, music. violin. How, did, how do you yeah. learn this music? Like so <laughs> questionable, you know, uh, which I totally understand. I, I get it, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I also did want to break away from that mold, mm. kind of like pinpointing myself as, hey, I'm. I'm a musician that only plays, uh, you know, traditional Taiwanese and Chinese music, mm. jazz context. Um, you know, part of it was like uh, trying to, you know, prove myself in, in that way. But also, um, it was easier to try to book gigs at more established um, jazz clubs. Because you'd had that first album. Well, no, because of the second album, because it was oh, because it's more straight ahead jazz. Yeah, okay, straight ahead jazz. Yeah, exactly. So actually, I played at the well, Birdland at that time uh, had expanded. So they had an upstairs Birdland. It is in New York City, mm-hmm. where that's where all the um, you know most of the music that's happened. And then uh, maybe two years ago, they opened up the downstairs area, which is Birdland Theater, and so I was able to book. Uh, the band there and uh, man it was like a packed house at that you know for that CD release um, that I did there and um, yeah definitely like it was more in line with uh, that kind of audience you know if I played the Taiwanese songs there maybe not so much you know (laughs) yeah it's it's very interesting to see which audiences which populations are 
targeted by just how you're making the music and by how the music sounds. Like you're able to book gigs for the uh, different Taiwanese organizations because you had this Taiwanese influence in your music for the first album. Exactly. Second album, you were able to go to sort of the top shelf jazz clubs in the city and play there just by virtue of the instruments that were used, the type of composition, and then the type of playing that correct. was done on the album. That's that completely correct, yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's super cool. So next thing I want to talk to you about is the company that you uh, co-founded, Yardbird Entertainment. Now, you guys do a whole host of really cool things, um, including helping just regular working musicians who need to figure out how to go virtual. Uh, you help people with their setups. You get people uh, professional. I saw, I think, Freddie Hendrix worked with you guys. You helped him out yeah. with something. Um, yeah, totally cool. And for those of you who don't know, Freddie Hendrix, amazing trumpet player, played with Alicia Keys and a bajillion other people. He's he's fantastic and also a great human being. Much agreed and much agreed. So, yes. uh, yeah, Yarbrough Yard Entertainment uh, originally started out two years ago. And uh, the other co-founder is Abel Morales, who is a fantastic saxophone player um, from Mexico, actually. And he came to William Patterson for his graduate studies. And um, I didn't meet him, actually, at William Patterson. We actually met at my uh, birthday party that I was having at the off-campus house <laughs> in William Patterson. So <laughs> that was an interesting first time meeting him. Um, and uh, we we started working together with the incredible uh, Slide Hampton. I had mm. the pleasure of working with Slide Hampton for two years. Actually, mm. I went over to his spot, which is not too far from where I live, um, almost every day for two years and traveled with him and um, yeah, just helped him to really uh, at his older age, you know, just help him get around, get some of the stuff going. Uh, led some of the big band stuff that. Uh, we were interested in putting together. So uh, Abel helped me to organize a lot of the big band stuff. And so we saw that we worked together really well as musicians, not only as musicians, you know, working on the bandstand, but also working off the bandstand. We uh, were very interested in, in having our own business. And so um, we had started Yardbird Entertainment as a way to try to find ways to actually book live music for other artists. Mm. And and at first we're like, well, you know, obviously there's very little uh, money inside the, you know, booking for jazz artists at jazz clubs business. <laughs> that that can be very, um, you know, you're not going to find big returns on, on that necessarily. So <clears throat> something we were doing was we were trying to reach out to um, different wedding um, organizations, wedding companies, <clears throat> as well as corporations, uh, to try to book some more of those like club date gigs. Meaning, uh, they were kind of like more, you want to say background, but you know, a lot of times they would hire us to kind of be like the special entertainment for like a day um, at the office or something along those lines. And yeah, so, you guys have worked with uh, Barclays and yeah, right. uh, one other company I can't remember the name of. Uh, we did something at HQ Trivia. There we go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> which was nice. Uh, we did stuff for Panasonic. I mean, like, yeah, we, we were definitely getting our feet wet with trying to learn how to book for more of those corporate settings mm. and wedding situations. Mm. Um, and, you know, we would hire a lot of the musicians that we believed in that, you know, maybe needed some more gigs at the time to supplement their other gigs. So, you know, doing those kind of gigs really helps to <laughs> definitely pay the bills and whatnot. For sure. Um, and just so people at home understand what we're looking at in terms of numbers, you said booking jazz gigs is not that profitable. I saw a Twitter post from uh, Randy uh, Brecker, uh, amazing, amazing, famous uh, trumpet mm -hmm. player. He was talking about how in the 70s, he used to book jazz gigs for I think it was one thousand four hundred dollars a night, and that's that's not a bad payday when it comes to jazz. <laughs> and he was saying that now he's still booking gigs for one thousand 
$400 a night and that there's been no increase in the pay uh, while living expenses have increased, inflation's gone up. Um, and if you guys think about booking, let's say a booker is going to take 10% of the fee to book the gig. 10%, if you're booking Randy Brecker, the great Randy Brecker, you're going to get about $140, $150 a night as the booker, which is not a lot of money to try and run a business off of. So now imagine you're booking for people who are not the great Randy Brecker, who are maybe less known, or like you said, trying to get their start, trying to get their feet or their toes wet in the pool booking. It's going to be nowhere near that $1,400 mark. And then let's say hypothetically you take 10% to try and run a business off of that is going to be very difficult. Yeah, it's a very... Uh... <laughs> You have to really love the music in mm. order to be able to pursue that as like a career. Mm. <laughs> I, I would say like um, <clears throat> a lot of the agents that do exist nowadays for those established jazz artists, a lot of times they've been doing it for a long time. And also they have other ways of funding themselves. Yes. And they do it for the love of the music, which mm -hmm. is really fantastic. But yeah, it's it's like like you said, um, the pay has not increased and and that was 400 is is pretty nice for people our age that's a really for, good for payday yeah you know, i mean usually what we're looking at is more like a 300 to yep. uh 600 dollar yep for the mm -hmm. band and you know maybe two free drinks <laughs> <You know? laughs> right that's what yep. we're looking at you know? yeah um so yeah so we started that um business more in line with trying to get some more of those corporate gigs and club dates um and we were doing pretty well for that first year that we were in business we actually were able to um i would say that year we booked uh maybe 30 to 40 gigs something like that which was pretty good for our first year not having any you know materials we actually what we did was we filmed the artists we, we would um reach out to the artists that we believed in and you know kind of have a contract with them and basically what we did was we would film them at a location, you know, with our equip with our own equipment. At that time, uh, you know, we were interested in videography ourselves individually. We we're like, well, we have this equipment and, you know, we had uh, these Zoom recorders, which are just like simple recorders that you could bring to a live gig and just, mm -hmm. you know, press record and, you know, that's it. Um, we had a couple of those things and we're like, well, let's just try to film the artists ourselves so that at least we have some materials to go out with. And so that's what we did. So we, these uh, materials you're going out with, you're trying to film them to essentially create what we call a press kit or an correct. electronic press kit, EPK, mm -hmm. that you're then going to send to whoever's in charge of the event. So they can say, okay, yes, I can now envision this in my event and then they will hire, hire the band via your service for that event and yeah. peter so you had this really great setup pre-pandemic that's working very well for you how does yardbird entertainment pivot once no one's allowed to go out anymore yeah so uh in march we lost all of those gigs uh for sure like we had well we had about like five you know ten gigs that were booked and they were all gone and so you know we kind of had several emergency meetings <laughs> between me and Abel because um, not only were those gigs gone, but also our own individual ones. You know, this this was like a side business for us, the Yardbird thing. Uh, this is something I just wanted to pursue and build up slowly. But now we knew that because all of our own personal gigs were gone and we had no way of paying for rent and whatnot, we had to figure out a way to pivot ourselves, not only with the business, but with ourselves. So... At that point, we made a commitment to be like, look, you know, we have this other equipment and we know this is going to be a service that people are going to want. They're going to want to be, they're going to want some filming. They're going to want some live stream. So you they're have the video it. equipment, you have the Zoom recorders, and you've started to accrue the knowledge necessary to use these effectively. Yes. Um, and we actually had to make some investments on equipment. And actually now at this point, we're not, we're not even using the original for the most part, the original equipment that we bought because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you just once once you get used to the production world, you know, like, oh, these people are using this for production. Oh, shit, we need that, you know. And so we would um, 
you know, try to set up our accounts so that we could pay for those things. Um, and we know that they pay back over time because mm. of the kind of gigs that we were doing. So what we did was um, we, you know, took the equipment that we had at that point in March. And then we reached out to a lot of the organizations that we were already affiliated with, uh, meaning places like Jazz House Kids, where both Abel and I have worked uh, extensively. And that's a great organization in Montclair, Montclair. that basically it's like a pre-college uh, rocket booster <laughs> for kids to get really good at jazz really fast because you're playing with incredible professional musicians like yourself, uh, like Abel, like Christian McBride, uh, right. like Mike Lee on the sax, um, and basically getting college level jazz instruction while you're still in grade school and high school. Co correct, correct. And they also had in school programs, uh, actually, that maybe a lot of people didn't know about, but uh, they would go to places like Patterson and Newark where uh, the schools are not as privileged to be able to have a music program, especially a jazz program. Mm. And they would actually implement a jazz band program, mm. either after school or during school. And I was actually teaching at two of those uh, schools. Uh, oh, that's one of awesome. them was in Elizabeth and one of them was in Newark. Um, and they were all like grade school students and, you know, starting to get to know the instruments. Like they didn't even play before and you'd have to teach them like a jazz song. So uh, anyone have watched Soul yet? The Pixar film? I, I'm, uh, I'm like, I've got 15 minutes left on the end. I haven't managed okay. to finish it yet, but yeah, most <laughs> yeah, of yeah. it. The, People who watch it just watch the beginning scene. Yeah. <laughs> what I experienced every single day for like a whole year. Okay, so uh, anyone that's watched it knows what I'm talking about. But um, so yeah, anyway, so we we would reach out to organizations like Jazz House uh, where we have worked. Um, we we done stuff for the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, which I already had connections with. Um, where basically we reached out to them and be like, hey, you know, we know that most likely you guys are going to need some split screen uh, performances, meaning everyone's in a box, individual box on a screen and they're all performing at the same time. Um, you're going to need those for the ensembles. Uh, you're going to need some live streaming to put out the content, you know, to showcase it to the parents or whatnot. Um, Zoom assistance and all this kind of stuff that we were like slowly getting better at at the same time. So while we were reaching out to them, we were also doing some intense research and asking our friends and <laughs> like getting our skills like really together. For all and also stuff. figuring out what the actual market is. Exactly. Market research. Very important, people. <laughs> market research. Find out who you're, um, you know, you want to say competitors, but really who, who are the other people that are doing this and what is the expectation? What is the usual rates, you know, that you ask for? So we were doing this all at the same time. You know, March was freaking crazy. March and April was just a sprint to definitely pivot. And uh, maybe we've had two live gigs <laughs> actually um, during that time uh, that we booked. But for the most part, like everything was remote. Everything was like, okay, just this number of people you can have live streamed. You know, we, we work in a very small team, just the two of us manning everything. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've been able to do a lot of great work with uh, different, especially music organizations. Uh, we're currently working with Midorian Friends in the city, which is usually, they are used to sending uh, teachers out for master classes uh, that would happen like at different schools, like if anyone has assemblies that, you know, feature a certain kind of music, they would send out an artist uh, to be able to do that. But obviously with pandemic, they can't do that. So they have to switch everything virtually and we're helping them to switch all their content to a virtual space. Um, and so, you know, like we've been doing a lot of that kind of work. Uh, definitely a lot of time on Logic, definitely a lot of time on Final Cut, which are programs uh, used for audio and video software editing. programs. Yeah, software programs. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's been a lot of time in front of the computer, um, but it's, it's been really fruitful being able to work with uh, a lot of 
different people, including uh, filming some stuff for Christian McBride, which actually I can't really uh, say exactly what it is for yet. Oh, exciting. Yet. Yeah, yeah. So, cool. Um, but we'll you know, keep on the lookout for it. Released, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, cool. so that's kind of just a synopsis of like how we pivoted, but it's been really fruitful for us. Like I can say that it's helped us to survive these past months, you know, be able to pay rent. I mean, it's just, it's hard, you know, for a lot of people. And we're just very grateful to be able to work with so many different organizations that are staying afloat, that are transitioning to a new space, um, you know, that they're not necessarily comfortable with, but we're willing to help them to uh, shift to that space. So now it's all audio, video, editing, plus live stream productions. That's For sure. And one of the really cool things that Yardbird Entertainment is doing that I'm just so into is you guys are starting a live concert series where you actually broadcast live. So imagine going out to a jazz club. I don't know if you've ever had the option of doing that in the place where you live, wherever you're listening to this, but one of the joys of life is to go out on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday night to a jazz club and catch a couple sets. So a set is going to be in between 45 minutes to two hours of music. Right. And then the musicians will take a break and then they'll come back and play again. And what uh, Peter and Yardbird Entertainment are doing is they're bringing that same feeling of that live show with really good quality audio and video live. Uh, bringing it in and if you think about it when you normally when you go out to the club you got to drive there so you're going to pay for gas if you're in New Jersey you're going to have to pay for tolls <laughs> if you're in New York yep. you're going to have to pay 20 bucks for parking um, then you're going to have to walk from wherever you parked or if you took the train in you have to walk to the show you're going to have to pay a table minimum you have to pay for the ticket uh, you, have, you have to get into the city so early you're so hungry you're probably going to end up buying dinner at the jazz club uh, right. So you you end up spending between let's say anywhere from twenty five to seventy five dollars depending on how many people are in your group a night. However, to get a live show broadcast directly into your living room where you can watch it and believe me, I do it in your pajamas while you are eating dinner. <laughs> you can get that for how much is a ticket typically for a Yardbird show? So typically right now it's fifteen dollars. Yeah, man, that that's what I call a deal. Plus, the really cool thing is you're when you buy a ticket to a Yardbird show, not only are you supporting future concerts with Yardbird, but you're also supporting these musicians who right now are just having a really hard time finding gigs, finding places to play, and finding a little extra money. So it's it's keeping our American culture alive during this time and that's that's that that's a really really incredible yeah. thing to be able to do yeah. so i actually caught the first um live stream you guys did which was i think alex parchment uh, a great trumpet yeah. player he's scored some songs on billboard i believe that's right um yeah he, he's doing he's doing pretty darn good um the type of music he's doing is really interesting. It was like I was listening to it and I was hearing like 80s R&B yep. meets Miles meets, and when we say Miles, we're talking about the trumpet player, Miles Davis, yes, that's right. meets like a little bit of like a bebop. Um, I hesitate to use the word intelligence, not to say that some music is more intelligent than others, yeah. but like- Maybe the bebop nuance. Yeah, yeah the be bebop nuance. In, but with this real R and B like smooth kind of thing, it was so much fun to listen to, and the band was so good. Like yeah, I was listening really to good. this guitar. Uh, my primary instrument's guitar, and I was listening to the guitar player in the band. A couple solos he had were just oh yeah yeah so good. And Alex bad. sounded great. The tunes were incredible. Um, so yeah, anyone go check out Alex Barchman. You, you won't be yeah. wasting your time. And yeah. um, I know you guys did another uh, Christmas stream recently. Uh, who was yes. that with? That was with uh, Bill Saxton, who's actually a legendary Har uh, Harlem saxophonist. Has been around on the scene for a very long time. Um, had studied with um, uh, Joe Henderson, actually. Oh, wow. A bit. Um, cool. And yeah, he... Um, 
he, he's kind of like older gentleman that has owned this jazz club for years, 16 years to be exact. Bill's Place is called in Harlem. Um, it's right down the street from the Shrine, um, which is another music venue in Harlem. And uh, he has not had any, like he's not technically adept at all, you know, and so he kind of reached out to us. Technically adept know, with technology. We're not talking about music here. Yeah, yeah, with <laughs> technology, exactly. Um, and so what he did is he, we have worked with him a little bit through the National Jazz Museum Harlem. They had hired him for uh, one gig and he saw the experience of working with us uh, with technology. He's like, man, can you guys do this like this live stream thing? Because um, I know it's the thing right now. I just don't have any of the equipment. I don't have any of the knowledge of how to put it out there, how to sell tickets for it or anything like that. Like I have this email list I've been building up for 16 years of people all around the world. And he really means it because I, I see the list of people buying tickets and it's like it's literally all around the world. Um, and he's like, I, you know, I have this audience, but I have no way of getting music to them. We're like, OK, let's let's work out a deal, you know, where basically we come in, uh, we film everything, put it together and then we do a percentage split, you know, to, to make it all work out for everyone. And so, um, you know, it's it's worked out beautifully our first time, you know, always uh learning trial by fire kind of thing. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really amazing to definitely um, be able to work into ca that capacity with, with Bill Saxton and to know that this opportunity has, is, is something that um, was really needed for himself, you know, not only for the business, but also spiritually for the musicians, like mm. to be able to come together to play, mm. and to know that it's going to be heard by mm. a lot of people, you know, mm. um, and it's just something that's just hasn't been happening and will not be happening for uh, a period of time that we're not, uh, you know, completely sure of. So um, I don't know if anyone saw recently, but Birdland actually the place I was mentioning before is actually going out of business. They oh my, no, that's they terrible. No that that's an iconic New York institution. Yeah, yeah. And a couple of different places that I've really come to love over the years have closed. Wow. I would never be able to perform there again. And it's just, it makes me so sad. And that's that's part of the reason why we're doing the thing, this whole Yardbird virtual concert series. It's not only to uplift the uh, you know musicians, but also to really consider the venues that are currently you know putting on music and want to you know, shift to this new space, but don't have the means to do it. We're trying to make that happen. We're trying to make that happen as much as possible without also like stretching ourselves too far because it is a lot of work. Um, but we, we know that it's good work. And so we're trying to continue that series as much as possible. And um, for jazz, jazz venues around the country, Yardbird Entertainment is and any live music venue around the country, Yardbird Entertainment is currently able to take bookings to help everyone get their setups. And correct, you got yeah, you guys are very much open and ready to assist anyone around the country who needs help getting set up for uh, online music. Let's talk a little bit about the reception so people understand really what they're dealing with. So, I read, I think that you sold 170 tickets. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, okay. First. Now, for people who don't understand what this means, <laughs> in a jazz club, you're going to be able to fit between 20 to maybe 50 people for the biggest ones. Oh, yeah. I mean, 50 is like pushing it. You, that's probably out somewhere in like, uh, I know there's a couple larger clubs uh, when you get to more sort of rural areas. But in the city, um, I'm thinking back to... Well, Smalls is definitely like 30. Yeah. Well, actually, it's a little bit more than that. It, it looks small, but uh, it does fit a lot of people. But that's within conditions that everyone can sit right next to you. Right. <laughs> so, so let's say that. basically on a given night, there's going to be two sets. Yeah. So the musicians are going to play for a total of maybe two to three hours, mm -hmm. and they're going to put a break in the middle. And then normally in the city, the way things are run is you buy a ticket to the first or the second set or both. Yeah. And um, so basically the idea is if you could get 40 people in the first set, 40 people in the second set, you'd sell a total of 80 tickets. Yeah. 
That's correct. Now, what you've done here is you've blown the top off of this concept and sold 170 tickets for a single concert, which is just and again, these are not huge numbers we're talking about here in terms of total total revenue, but it's even better than doing a live show. So I guess my question is, how long do you see those numbers maintaining themselves for? Because I think we can anticipate that at the beginning, there's a rush because everyone's been starved of content for so long. And especially all these, there's a real culture around Jersey and around the city and around the world of people who really love jazz and like they don't play they may not understand music theory they may not be able to read a note of music but they go out three to five times a week buying food buying drinks showing up at open mics showing up at gigs for people who are just starting out to support the jazz to support the culture there's a there's this infrastructure of just jazz lovers out there that sort of make this whole economy work. That is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think uh, it really depends on how we're looking at like the audience base that are tuning into these kind of things, right? Mm. So, for example, in Bill's case, where we sold like you know 170 tickets. Um, like I mentioned before, he has an email list that's mm. building up for 16 years, right? So it's very easy for him to have these fans that, you know, come from all around the world, come in, have a really fantastic experience, um, you know, want to know what's happening there and be able to participate in some way or form as much as possible. And so I, we did have that experience. Like, for example, it is 170 tickets sold, but actually some of them bought more than one ticket. Like this one guy in Germany, he bought like 12 tickets <laughs> because he just wanted to buy it for all his friends. He mm. loves the place so much, you know, um, which is actually a great business uh, thing. I was like, oh, like selling tickets for friends. Okay, that's okay. Interesting. You know, buying tickets for friends. Yeah, um, you get, you get, listen, you, you get three, <laughs> three of your friends buy a ticket. You get 50% off your next ticket purchase yeah, or something. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're, we're, we're trying to think about that. Stuff, cool. But, um, but in terms of like how long that's going to last, yeah, it's it's interesting. It really depends on who you're reaching out to mm. and how how much they're, you know, engaged with the fact that like there's supporters, but then there's lovers. You know, I, I feel like the supporters are the ones that go like you know, like friend supporters are the ones that go like, Yeah, go you and then they go to the first show mm. and then they never you know, come back again because they were just there to support you the first time, which is great, you know, as a friend. But, um, you know, is that reliable in terms of, you know, <laughs> your market audience and like, you know, trying to have consistent revenue come in? Uh, answer is no. And if you're trying super hard to get those kind of people to watch your show and you're continuously like messaging them, being like, watch my show, watch my show, it's not going to work, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they're they're already set in their what they like, you know, net, this current situation of the internet plus Netflix plus subscription services allows people to be able to engage with the content that they love, catered specifically for them, um, with the algorithms working exactly in their favor. So like <laughs> so, you know, uh reaching out to those kind of people is is not necessarily the easiest. I'm not saying it's it's uh impossible. To sure. To get but kind of who you want to reach out to are the jazz lovers. Exactly. Jazz lovers. I'm, I'm just thinking of this one guy. Maybe you've met him around Montclair. You know JP? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That Listen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. JP, if you're hearing this, hey, man, so much respect. But the epitome of a jazz lover. Like when, when I was starting out doing the trying to do the jazz thing, like he would mm -hmm. come to any gig that I did. Yep. Yep. So supportive. Yep. When Cecil's was around, he was there. I think he, he was like living there like every Cecil's night. Uh, and of course, he well, once he uh, met his wife, he started bringing his wife out. Um, really just there's an incredible group of people who come out to support jazz. And on this on this uh, topic, I've got a question. Is there like a Facebook group for jazz lovers, like international, that maybe Yardbird could start 
and then like you post jazz lover stuff and then once a month you post a concert for people to come check it out just an idea yeah, yeah there, there's there's actually you know it's interesting um so facebook in the past few years have focused more on groups mm. more so than pages right Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, there's a ton of international jazz groups already mm. that are established that have like uh, anywhere between a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand people, like you know, kind of engaged in this in this content. Um, whether they see it or not, or like it, or, you know, I mean, everyone's posting in these groups like con constantly, you know. <laughs> so uh, you know, it's not always the case that they're always going to engage with their content. However, um, it is a very focused group. And so, you know, what we try to do is we try to, uh, they allow us to post in those groups uh, with, with that kind of content. Like, okay, here's a virtual show. Because there's not a lot of those things happening. So when it does happen, it's like... It's okay, exciting post, for everyone. Post it here. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Post it here. No problem. Um, so we, we've been doing that uh, as a way to get the word out. But that that is definitely something that we were trying to do pre-pandemic, actually, with the Jazz Biz 101 stuff that we were putting together. We were trying to create a group that was centralized around the idea um, and then be able to also, um, you know, advertise a lot of the stuff that, uh, you know, we were doing as well. So, you know, that, that's a very that's, those are very great tactics to be able to uh, engage with like audience members in, in different ways, not only with trying to like sell something 100 percent of the time, but also be able to, um, you know, provide an experience that is like, OK, I, I love this thing. Uh, here's some educational content on this thing. Here's a video on this thing. Like, you know, just being multifaceted in that way it really helps to um, engage with different audience members. For sure. Yeah. And I know we spoke about having an established artist with an established email list. Yeah. Uh, seeing success with you guys. Um, but I just wanted to reiterate that even if someone's starting out for the first time, maybe you graduated college two years ago, you've been gigging solidly since then, you haven't really had a time to make yourself a Facebook page or something like that, you can still go to Yardbird Entertainment and they'll set you, you will set anyone up uh, for success to bring their music online in a polished professional way. Yeah, we, we definitely will try. I think one of the things is because we're musicians ourselves, <laughs> um, the the way we like to think about these things is they're definitely more partnership based. Where mm. like you know, if someone's going to come in, I like for example, I've had someone reach out to me uh, that went like, "Hey, um, I want you guys to uh, record one of my shows," and I was like, "Well, what's the plan?" And they're like, "Oh, I don't have a." really have a plan i was like well that doesn't really help us you know it's going to be a waste of your time and also a waste of our time if we're just coming in being like okay we're just going to record a show and then that's it it's out there you know go buy the tickets <laughs> you know like that doesn't really uh that's not going to foster anything um that's not going to create any community with anyone so and, you really want to work with people who are looking to reach out to a community they're looking to they already have an idea of what it is they're trying to do in terms of their concert in terms of their show and then you want to have an artistic partnership with them correct and then be able to understand what's their main goal mm. of doing it because um you know we're not just a production company that comes in do the work and then buy mm. right like we we want to be able to build you know i, I don't like using the word brand all the time but build the brand of their themselves mm. using this content as a way to um, elevate that. And if they have a plan, it's easier for us to be able to fashion this content to be catered to particular audiences, to be able to reach out, to be able to market in the right places. Um, so for example, with Bill's place, like I know that there's uh, people that are interested in just Harlem jazz in general, you know? mm. not only as a artistic thing, but also as a cultural, you know, study for some people. And so there are groups focused on that that you know want to participate, buy a ticket, be able to see what it's about, right? Um, so for us, that's easier, and it's it's makes it feel more wholesome rather than just something. Oh, let's just put in the work and see what happens. Like 
I, I'm not that kind of person. I'm very practical. Got it. Um, yeah, I like to see results. Um, and I think they want to see results too. So For sure. So calling all artists who have a vision for what they want to execute, hook up with Yardbird and you guys will exactly. make it happen. Exactly. We'll, awesome. we'll make it happen together. We're not going to make cool. it happen for you. We'll make it happen together. Yes. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So um, what I'd like to do now is move on to the sort of the second section of our podcast. I know we're running a little late on time. Do you have a couple extra minutes today, oh, yeah, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. yeah this, awesome. So. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk a little bit about performance and creativity and yourself. So everyone's really gotten to know you, gotten to know about your projects. Uh, now we're going to kind of dive into how you make all this happen. So let's start with the most basic and important piece of the puzzle. How many hours do you sleep a night and how do you find sleep impacts the various aspects of your music and your creativity? Man, this is like... That's probably a hundred percent of what it's all about, right? Like, okay, so number one thing with sleep, because this is actually a pretty popular question, like how many hours do you sleep? Mm. Okay, so everyone needs a different amount of hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. And you and everyone has to understand that it's individualized. Absolutely. You know, everyone says like, oh, seven hours is is average, eight hours. Is. No, 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 no. Like I know people who sleep three hours and get are completely functional mm -hmm. and the people who sleep nine hours and still need an additional two hours to be able to <laughs> function wholeheartedly right so um i would say you know a lot of it has to do with your current state of well-being at that mm. time like uh for me when i was in college um i thought i was getting by with like six or seven hours of sleep and actually that was kind of more detrimental to myself because Playing trombone is a very physical aspect. Um, it's a very physical thing, activity. And in order for these fine muscles to work inside the, the mouth and like whatnot, um, you need the amount of sleep to be able to recover, to be able to perform at your best all the mm. time. So for me, I know that my amount of hours where I'm the most functional is actually eight hours. I thought it was six for the longest time. But once I started getting eight, then it was like a uh, really eye opener because then I would just be able to wake up, be able to play my tr trumbo just more easy. Like it was a lot of things were just more um, felt better throughout mm. the day. So I think realizing that first, you know, within yourselves and whatnot is is super important. So when I say like the, this is, you know, what works for me, it's not going to work for um, everyone else. However, 100%. dude. Yeah, but definitely like the routine definitely helps. Now, that. on that routine, what time are you going to sleep and what time are you waking up? Uh, depends on the project. and. Well, in, so, let's yeah. say you don't have to stay out till two in the morning playing jazz. Uh, a, a, a typical day where you're just living as a regular non-artist human being. Okay, so I would say during periods where you are intentionally trying to be... Um, trying to be in a creative space, mm -hmm. trying to practice in a very routine manner, which mm -hmm. is something I'm not currently doing. Uh, usually you want to um, be able, for me, I was sleeping at um, 11 or 12 and being okay because, you know, regular work hours for most people is nine to five. Like, you know, my I've been married for uh, three years now and, you know, my, my wife works a regular job, a nine to five job. So, you know, aligning with her schedule after a while was very beneficial to me <laughs> because then I was able to use that morning time to be able to have this like preparation time for the rest of the day. So Without do you wake up at the same time every morning? So let's say you go to bed at 11 or 12. Are you then uh, modulating the hour you're waking up at or do you have an yeah. alarm set at the same time every day? Yeah, at, at, a, at a certain time in my life, I was doing that. Like where I was basically, okay, set the alarm for uh, 9, 30, 10, something like that, right? And then be able to get to work knowing that, okay, I have this amount of space in the morning time to be able to warm up, you know, prepare, send all these preliminary emails, you know, and whatnot, and then prepare, you know, span out the entire day properly and then go to sleep on time. Um, more recently, <laughs> it hasn't been like that. 
just because of the fact that a lot of this video and audio editing stuff occurs after they do the work in the daytime. So for example, like they'll send you all this stuff, this content that you're supposed to edit after they've done the work. And most of the time that happens in the morning or daytime. So I have to shift my schedule in order to make it work. Mm. Um, so more recently, I actually been going to sleep at like two or three <laughs> and then waking up like more at like, yeah, 10 or 11 or 12 <laughs> to, to, and you know, some, some phases in life are going to be like that. But I would say that during that creative period when you're writing a lot and you're practicing a lot, it, it, for me, it was a lot better to keep a routine schedule. The creativity like, comes from structure. It, yes, exactly. Cause you know that it's set, you know, that certain aspects in life is set so you can concentrate Mm, on uh, everything else important. yes 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 that, yep. that for me was very important and um i should probably get back on that <laughs> myself uh but because of the current situation it's it's been a little bit more uh chaotic but that's okay you know i i feel like uh being comfortable with the fact that it doesn't have to be a hundred percent routine you know is is part of life you know i i try to uh not get too stressed out about like not having a routine either you know oh for sure uh, yeah <laughs> keep get, keeping it easy so have you ever experimented with any diets in an attempt to influence your creativity uh, so you know, like something. keto paleo anything like that yeah um so actually pre pandemic i was working out quite a bit uh with i actually had a trainer uh george gray who's actually a fantastic drummer oh cool he's also a trainer <laughs> so i was training for about half a year uh you know basically going to the gym basically uh two or three times a week and he was trying to put me on this like um it was kind of like a vegetarian kind of diet where um well actually it was no red meat i forget what that one is called specifically I think um, it's called no fun. I could be wrong. Vegans, no I'm no, joking. No, <laughs> okay. No fun anyway, keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> no joy in life. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think, man, uh, I tried it and it was just not working for me. But I, you know, a lot of it has to do with, again, com comfortability, familiarity. Like, I'm sure if I continued it for a year, if I really pursued myself disciplined myself in that way it would have been better but i think just the working what for me at that point it's more important about the working out mm. aspect that was really helping me to um you know before that i was getting tired on all of these gigs you know i don't think people under a certain age probably don't <laughs> understand but once once you hit a certain point you start to feel your body being like i'm actually tired you know on this gig and um, I was doing a lot of wedding gigs at that point, too. So it was like hours of just standing and also hours of, you know, um, dancing, quote unquote dancing. <laughs> but then you're also you're so tired from that experience that the next day you wake up and the last thing you want to do is to drag yourself out of bed to exercise. Exactly. Especially if you know that the next night you're going to have to get up and stand up for another three hours and do your little like, you know, one, two steps while you're, steps. you know, t t playing your superstition horn parts. And it's like, yeah. So I think the fact that you broke that cycle is really, really interesting. I know when, when I was working, uh, doing gigs and stuff like that, I was not exercising. Like the energy just was not there. You know, because you have yeah. to practice during the day, this, that, and the other. And then sort of music becomes this overarching, it becomes the priority to a degree where you're just thinking about it all the time and there's not a lot of room for a lot a lot else. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's easy to be pre, um, preoccupied with music so much that it kind of wears on other aspects of like living absolutely <laughs> you know? um I, I think that's a very normal feeling and i think i because i saw that in other musicians especially the ones that i was working with just this overall tiredness i wanted to break that cycle uh just on just on my own you know what i mean like mm. i saw what it was like growing older as a musician i've i've hung around enough older musicians to hear their 
aches and you know them so ooh, the when they get up out of the chair yeah, yeah. and I, I wanted to avoid a certain degree of that and mm. that's what prompted me to start the strength training i was mm. like working out quite a bit but um since pandemic it's been too easy to, to not fall into not doing anything because you're at home and you know uh, the other thing is where your headspace is at, right? Like if you're used to working in certain areas of your apartment or home or whatever, um, you often it's harder to break those habits of like, OK, let me work out in the same area. Like, no, <laughs> you know that area as this and therefore you establish that presence. You know, um, I do believe in like creating the environment. Yes. In, you know what I mean? And yeah. So um, if it's hard to break those environments once you establish oh this is the place that i rest i come home to rest and that was like it's yeah, also to... it's also highly beneficial to create those spaces yeah like when you have an office space that let's say you don't bring your personal phone into or you have an office space you know you don't bring food into or yeah. just creating rules like that for yourself around a practice space or a workspace where it's like this is the area where i'm going to be doing x and That's then your right. brain actually builds up all these really interesting structures and ways of approaching your practice time because you're in this certain space, you're surrounded by this certain environment, things look a certain way. That actually puts you in that place. Um, I do a similar thing with falling asleep too. Like, you know, if you're lying in bed and you can't fall asleep after half an hour, get up, get out of there. Because as soon as your brain starts creating the habit of lying in bed and not being asleep, then that can perpetuate and become even worse. It, it's the same exact yeah. idea. So yeah. how did how did your exercise impact your creativity and your ability to perform consistently? Um, so I know physically speaking, it was definitely much easier to be able to get around and not feel this soreness or tiredness mm. that I was experiencing. Because I was actually falling asleep at the wheel coming home from gigs. Uh, but like, you know, very short periods of time. <laughs> but yeah, like, but you still, know what I mean? Like, those little you know micro... Doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like this, uh, closing your eyes very quickly and be like, oh, shoot. Um, so uh, that started to disappear a lot more, mm. um, which was really nice. And then in terms of the creative aspect, um, you know, to be honest, I feel like it didn't really do <laughs> too much. But at the same time, who knows what's going on in the chemical imbalances in your brain that's you know what I mean? Like that's really influencing your creative uh, space. Like for me, mentally, it's always been the same. You know, spiritually, it's kind of been the same, whether I'm working out or I'm not. And I think that's just something that's maybe for me, that's just the way that I feel. Um, but um, yeah, I, I didn't really feel like I was being more uh, in line with like my uh, creative self <laughs> by you know engaging these activities what i did know was that i was setting myself up to be able to have longer periods of creative space ah. i didn't feel tired you know what i mean like it, it wasn't because i feel like when you work on music you work on music you know what i mean and when you work on other aspects of life yes you are working on music as a general broader term in terms of like um you know getting life experience um getting uh yeah having the physicality to be able to perform longer periods of time and whatnot but in terms of uh working on music i always just believe like nothing beats that <laughs> practice time <laughs> for sure like it's it's uh when i was practicing all day you feel i felt more connected with the trombone even if i wasn't physically always there i always felt more connected and spiritually mm -hmm. more connected mm -hmm. um so it's it's hard for for uh me to say <laughs> cool <laughs> but it definitely not. impacted yeah. your ability to perform consistently and it increased the time that you could dedicate and the focus that you could dedicate to being creative correct which cool. in turn affects your creative space yeah absolutely yeah so what's your support system like and how does that impact your ability to perform oh God. and yeah, be creative <laughs> that that's a really great question because uh um i think there's a whole famous thing about jazz wives <laughs> where basically it's like you know a lot of people are not afraid to admit it but you know a lot 
just look at a lot of the jazz musicians that you know we love and respect um it's not always 100 percent performing that's continuing their lifestyle you know um a lot of times there is like you said there's a support system that's there like you know my wife has a regular nine to five job and we're together we're able to pay off this uh mortgage for this condo that we just acquired like last year congratulations you know? yeah, it's amazing i'm so happy it's for you great. guys yeah it's been uh great during this whole pandemic i mean nice to have all the space and stuff for sure like that, you know um so you know she has the health insurance you know and stuff like that that makes it definitely a lot easier um and you know so that support system is like really that that's the bread and butter of like just what makes everything happen right but in terms of like you know growing up and and stuff like that like i definitely uh, relied on my parents heavily to be able to uh do a lot of the things that i was able to do like be able to go to college and you know and whatnot and my my parents have a history of you know graduate school and my grandparents have a history of graduate school it just runs in the family kind of thing right so you have to go to school for something <laughs> and for me like music they were like oh well i i didn't want to go to college at first actually i was like you can save a lot of money by not going and they're like well you know everyone in the family got a degree you gotta get one too. <laughs> okay all right you know and i i wasn't going to complain about it so um but so you know all those things really add up and I'm not afraid to admit that that you know those things come at a privilege and uh, you know it's it's been a privilege to be able to just continue um, playing this music and be able to hang out and be able to you know support myself um, after a while to be able to work and um, get everything going like right after college I started working at Jazz House Kids I actually actually in the more administrative position. So I was getting paid as a part-time worker over there, and that helped to pay a lot of the rent bills and, and whatnot to keep my jazz addiction going. <laughs> <laughs> be able to get into the city, pay the tolls, you know, pay the ticket price and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you work a whole day and then you basically go out and hang out. And I was doing that for a while mm. so I could sustain myself performing. And once I knew that I was saving, actually saving money, um, then I can make that decision and be like, let me not work this job anymore. Mm. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, once you have that privilege, once you know that, like, you don't have to do that thing anymore to sustain your living, it's like a really fulfilling experience. Um, I definitely appreciate it. But I really don't like the saying of people sometimes say, uh, um, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Oh, no. I, I you, think it's you, the opposite. You're going to work. <laughs> If you love what you do, you're going to want to work. <laughs> you're like, right, exactly. You're going to work on the weekends. You're going to work, you know, <laughs> the mentality of like, you know, having a business for yourself. Make, people make it seem like, oh, you just go on vacation. And, no, uh, no, 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 no. I mean, no. that is one way of running your own business that you're taking all the money out of the business and just like using it to finance trips to Florida. But like, correct. <laughs> or wh wherever it is you want to go. And uh, probably not ethical to a certain degree either. Uh, so yeah, like, um, so yeah, ha the support system was uh, very important as, as well as you know, the Taiwanese community has been very supportive of my projects. Mm. Um, my friend networks has been very supportive. Um, obviously the jazz community as a whole, like it's, I, I just feel like everyone here, especially around here in Jersey, like my more local community of networking musicians just been, even if, they, if it's not a financial thing, it's a, it's a um, spiritual, it's a uh, humanistic level of just support, you know, um, knowing that there's other people like you. There's other people that are doing what you're doing and that it's OK to take those risks. It's OK to feel like uh, that it's really hard, you know, <laughs> for sure. Um, and knowing that other people share that experience is, is really it's good. It's really nice. To have yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've got a uh, a different question for you in a different sort of vein, but s similar similar sort of feel. So what part of music comes the easiest to you? And follow up to that, were you born with it or was it something that you had to work on? 
Mm, what part of the music comes the easiest? None of it. <laughs> um, okay, so I feel like the if anything, the easiest thing that comes to me is probably the appreciation aspect. Like it it doesn't seem like much, but at the end of the day, there are it, it's it's easy. I, I kind of grew up liking a lot of different genres of music. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I grew up with classical around the house and like Christian rock, and, like, whatever my family was listening to. Um, and then going into more of a headspace of like whatever my friends were listening to at the time. And it was like combination of like American pop music, rock music, but also Japanese like J-pop and J-rock and <laughs> so metal and yeah from what i'm hearing you say it's actually very interesting because what you're saying the easiest thing that came to you if i'm understanding correctly is that what came easily to you was understanding and appreciating the different cultures and the different musics and just feeling the different the different groups associated with those music and that's even more interesting because if we look at both your first album project and the stated purpose of Yardbird, it's to bring communities together. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. That it draws like full circle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I that's did a fascinating. Like that the other day, where um, there, I have to do this thing for a uh, kind of a Zoom conference that I'm doing, where basically it's a life map. You you write down where you were born, you know, like that's the first starting point. And then at the very end point, you write the other point is that particular Zoom conference that you're in, mm. like that moment. And then you have to connect between all of those you know, points, you know, some significant things that happen in your life, you know. And so that's what made me think about that. Like, OK, what's the thing that comes easiest in music? Because, you know, um, to be honest, music is not easy at all for me. Mm. It's never been easy for me. Like mm. when I went to. um when I got into trombone, it took a lot of work. I didn't understand. I was kind of tone deaf in a way. Like hmm. I still am a little bit tone deaf in certain ways. Well, okay, but let, uh, let, let's but, be clear. When we say tone deaf, you're not talking about scientific tone deafness, which only 0.02% of the population correct. has. You're talking about having issues audiating the music, correct? correct? And, recognizing, and recognizing different... Uh, I had to teach myself actually um, how to recognize pitches more accurately. I think a lot, of, I mean, a lot of musicians do this, you know, with the ear training, where basically yeah. they tried, they learn like the difference between do, re, mi, and like the distance mm-hmm. between those things. That for me came a lot later, <laughs> actually, in my life. Like when I was learning trombone, well, a lot later, a lot harder, a lot harder, and a mm. lot later than most other people that I was surrounded by, right? Hmm. So when I think about like um, what comes easy for them, it's like hard, it's just like insanely hard <laughs> for me. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain because, okay, let's put it this way. When I was really young, actually, um, I went to a special ed preschool because I actually had an ear infection while I was younger and I, was, I had issues um, recognizing speech wow actually i went through speech therapy all the way until third grade oh wow Um, yeah and so like when when i say like tone deaf and actually went to uh suzuki method for violin that's what my first um instrument and that's all learning basically by like numbers and a combination of ears but at at time it was more for numbers for me because it was just really hard to recognize those those pitches in in a way that made sense to me oh wow Um, so yeah, it's it's weird, like this experience of not being able to hear that well, you know, for that period of time was, I think, very crucial to uh, being able to understand music and to feel music at a certain level, you know, to understand it. So um, yeah, I had to teach myself how to audiate, how to recognize pitch at a higher degree in order to function as a professional musician. So you had to work harder 
to get to the same level that you see everyone else at, essentially, is, is what Correct. you're saying. Yeah. yeah, when I went to college, it was definitely like, uh, I was definitely the lowest of the totem pole. <laughs> like, improvising for me just meant like making up things and not even recognizing what pitches I was necessarily playing, right? Like, that, it was that level of ignorance, I, I feel like, uh, going in. And it probably was. And so, <laughs> it was, uh, I, I, I went deep into... Um, recognizing, trying to learn how to recognize pitch uh, at a higher degree. Like I definitely studied a lot of um, uh, books that actually was able to um, kind of walk me through the process more in a very uh, step-by-step way rather than be, you know, usually an ear training class, they'll just be like, oh, follow my lead or something like that. And All right, was, here's a major third. Got right. it? Great. See you next right. time. Right. I had to like really understand what does that actually feel like on the inside, like it get a deeper level understanding because I just didn't recognize it the same way my other musician peers would. So, did you try using anything like uh, the Earmaster software or anything like that, or was it mainly uh, just books? Yeah, yeah, it was actually I was doing a lot of drone exercises at that time. There was uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book, um, Harmonic. Uh, oh, man, it's a really thick textbook. <laughs> I actually gave it to my professor at Rutgers, uh, Conrad Herwig, great trombone player, because he was like, man, I've heard about that book, but I don't have uh, and actually uh, let lend it to him, but he never gave it back. So um, I don't have any more. So I'm forgetting the name of the, the book, but it basically made you practice with drones. Hmm. Basically, drones are just held out notes. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. And and so you I can uh, on YouTube, Best Music Coach has uh, uh, drones in 12 keys. You can also find them on the guitar channel as well. Plugged. OK. Hey, there it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> drones, drones are very good in terms of being able to recognize how different things feel over these drones, different mm. pitches, different chords and stuff like that. Um, so that really helped me to really uh, feel a lot more centered hmm. in terms of like understanding pitch. <laughs> That's fascinating. Um, I've actually had a similar experience using drones. Um, yeah. My my issues with pitch came more from like ADHD, just like not being able to focus mm. on what was happening in the moment. Uh, but I lived with drones for like a year and a half, maybe two. Like uh, everything I practiced was with a drone. And then from there, the sort of... Uh, I don't know. It, it gives you some sort of concrete uh, foundation, yeah, with yeah, with which to perceive all the different pitches. It's like slowing things down. You know what I mean? Like that's. I, I think that's the best way to learn anything is is to slow it down. You know, and drones allow you to have that space mm. to slow things down to its minimalist degree. Mm. You understand the the basics of what's happening. Yeah, mm. It's it's really good tool. I really recommend it for a lot of people. Absolutely. Uh, YouTube.com, best music coach for drones in <laughs> all 12 those. keys. Absolutely. <laughs> um, what time of the day when you're in your practice routine do you like to practice? It used to be morning, mm. but now that there's nothing to do, well, actually, it still is the morning because you start out, you know, for me, if you start out the day with music, it's easier. Mm, than trying to find time at the end of the day. Yep. <laughs> exactly. After you're drained mentally, it's a very big task to ask yourself to, um, you know, focus in that in that way. But I think, again, it comes, again, from the fact that music might be easier for some people to just, like, engage in because it's more part of their being inherently. Mm -hmm. I think for, for me, it's uh, something that you got to, work at the beginning of the day mm. <laughs> and, mm. and like it becomes a part of your being for the rest of the day and for the rest of the week and you know um for me that's it's always been like that i'm a very obsessive kind of person like as soon as i get into one thing i just want to stick to it like if i start in the day working on a project on the computer i want to make sure i get it done mm. you know by the end of the day <laughs> so i'm not focused on music necessarily uh during that time frame and yeah. During the periods, let's say when you're preparing for an album, mm -hmm. how many hours a day are you practicing and how many days a week are you practicing? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely at least 
uh, four hours a day when I'm getting ready for a record. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, yeah, at least four hours a day. I used to do more because I thought that would be really beneficial. But at the end of the day, what happens is, uh, you tire yourself out, not only mentally, but physically. Mm. And so you're actually not in shape for the record as much as you think you are. And then also that like, extra time past that four hour mark, it's like, how much are you actually getting done? How exactly. effective is that practice past the four hour mark? Exactly, you get better at effective practicing as yes. you do it for sure. And so you don't need eight hours necessarily. Like you could, if you really uh, thought it out and went like, I gotta practice this amount of things and it takes this amount of time, like you, you can definitely do that. Um, but for me, it's never worked out that well, mostly because trombone is such a physical instrument where like if your chops, meaning your muscles get tired in your mouth, then um, it starts to deteriorate. It mm. gets worse, just like working out too much. You know, like you overuse the muscle. Now the next day, you need you need to rest. You know, it's just a very natural part of any physical activity. You need to rest. And if you don't have that rest, you're overworking it. Even if you mentally feel okay, like physically, you're you need it. So, yeah, uh, four hours is definitely a good amount preparing for. Speaking today. of speaking of hours, do you have time for a couple more questions? Yeah, sure. All right, awesome. Go ahead. So, we talked about ineffective practicing mm -hmm. because you're spending too many hours going. Um, have you ever gotten to a place where you burned yourself out creatively? or instrumentally, physically, that you've just been at a place where it was just like, there's no creative spark, there's no desire to practice. Have you ever gotten to that point? Oh my God, yeah. And that actually happened after uh, a bunch of gigs plus the album release of New Age Old Ways. Mm. Basically what happened was I was composing like one or two songs a week <laughs> for a while. And and practicing and going out to these gigs and whatnot and living um, life and <laughs> living life yeah trying to get yeah getting married and that was a very intense period of you know time and so I definitely burned myself out I I tried writing I remember this experience of trying to write this one song and I just couldn't finish it I just really <laughs> um. And not only that, I was being commissioned to write some music. Oh, no. And, and I couldn't really find anything that... Because you know what it was? It was like you had gotten all the ideas that had been built up in your mind for out. like a year. Yeah. And you got it out. You know what I mean? And anything else that comes out is going to be some kind of repetition or regurgitation of those ideas, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit better. But like, you know, how how effective is that really, you know, on a personal level? And so like... I started to feel like, oh, shoot, I need to just take a break and find other uh, influences and other experiences to help me reconsider a lot of these thoughts that are going in my mind, you know, because, you know, let's say you're into an album at that time period of time, like two or three albums, which I was, you know, and, you know, you get that sound so much in your head that you just start hearing all your songs in that way, <laughs> all of those um you know, all of your improvisation is based off of those things. And so I was like, man, I don't know if I really like that. You know, I don't know if I'm really into that as much as other people are, you know. Mm. Um, and so um, I, I would consider this time right now to be my break time. Mm. Um, I, th I think a lot of people like are using this time. They, they like to think that they're using this time to prepare for when everything gets back open. Um, for me, <laughs> I've been using it as a time to actually be like, this is probably the only time I might have a break in my life. Yeah. Yeah, right? Like, mm -hmm. You know, you can either use this time, if, you know, you think effectively like, okay, this is time to practice. I think for a lot of people, that's true, right? Like I need to use this time to shed this amount of things and whatnot um I, i'm just not that kind of person uh, i like to be involved in the community and then come back home and then think reflect and then practice based off of those experiences right um yeah i'm, I'm more of that kind of person so it's hard for me to use this time to be like let me practice all this stuff that i don't even know 
when things are going to be back open, when I'm going to be able to present any of these ideas or to be able to share these experiences with other people. Like, you're just recharging. If you have an idea come in your head, maybe you're making a voice note, maybe you're writing something down, maybe you're just demoing something out on little clips yeah. if you get an idea. But other than that, you're just sort of living, working on your other projects and letting the batteries recharge in the background. And producing other people's music actually has been, well, not, I wouldn't say producing, but definitely like mixing and mastering their albums um, or, or tracks have actually been very beneficial for me because now <laughs> I have to listen to the track over and Ah, over again. yes. So now I'm actually getting new ideas from those tracks and I'm actually humming those songs after I'm done with them because they're just stuck there. Mm. I'm like, wow, that's really catchy. Or like, you know, I'll do videos, music videos, split screen videos for other people of their album projects. And it sounds great. And I'm just like, wow, that's a great idea. So um, I don't know. I've tried now that you mentioned it, it's it's definitely been um, that kind of period of time for me where I'm checking out new stuff, you know, um, because I wasn't really doing that before this. So new stuff, meaning um, even stuff that my peers are releasing. I wasn't really doing too much of that before but now because of the fact that i'm so ingrained in in these projects with other people it's like now i get to experience all of that and it's it's really beautiful what people are putting out right now um i think i have a lot more appreciation for that than i than i did back in college where i was really deep studying into the tradition you know into like you know my heroes and stuff like that now i have a much wider appreciation um based off of the things that I've been hearing. So yeah, it's it's nice. <laughs> For sure. And second to last question, have you ever experienced performance anxiety? And if so, how does it manifest? Performance anxiety, meaning that- uh, So like stage fright, essentially. Stage fright, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think that happens every single time. Mm. <laughs> Even- like I have this thing upcoming on Sunday. It's like a Zoom performance thing. It's only five minutes, but I'm already having performance anxiety just thinking about the fact that I have to perform for other people and be heard on a live setting. Like it is very, um, it, it's definitely really bad at first when I first started performing out in public, but it's just like anything else. You keep doing it and you just slowly not get better at it, but you get better at dealing with it. And so, um, you know, I always get the same amount of nervousness, but how I deal with it now is much different than I did back then. Now I just go in with uh, a more of a style of like um, knowing that I'm more comfortable with myself. You know, I think it takes a lot of like deep self learning. Like, why are you nervous? You know? mm. <laughs> what, what, what makes you so, you know, ex anxious in the first place that's causing you to feel this way and if it's because like you're uncomfortable expressing yourself in in public you know you have to question like why why is that what mm. are those experiences that make me afraid of that and if it's irrational you can better deal with those feelings yeah super interesting yeah, yeah. i think having that that moment of introspection of saying like, okay, why am I feeling this way? And then taking exactly. one step further, being like, where am I feeling it? Am I feeling it in my hands? Am I feeling it in my mm -hmm. belly? Am I feeling it in my chest? Like, right. what are the physical symptoms? Like almost engaging in a mindfulness exercise around it mm -hmm. and saying, yeah. so what is this? Let me live in it. Let me feel it. Let me understand it. And then once you understand it, maybe it doesn't go away, but you can kind of coexist with it in a better way. <laughs> yeah, I remember shaking a lot. To the point where, like, it would be hard to play. Wow. Be like this, right? And I, I just think about those times. But then, like, as soon as it's done, you're not nervous anymore. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's such, in, in my mind, I just remember thinking, this is so stupid. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you literally, within a split second, you went from being a nervous wreck to being completely okay. So mm. why is that? Mm. You know? And I, I really wanted to get to the heart of that because it was, it was bothering me to that point where mm. it was like inhibiting my ability to perform and express myself in a way that I was comfortable expressing myself in other 
situations, you know, um, especially when you know that like you're being judged. I think a lot of it has to do with knowing that you're being like judged to a certain degree or even judging yourself people. or judging yourself to a certain mm. degree. Right. Um, so, you know, learning to live with the fact that like people will judge the way that they judge and you're going to judge the way you're going to judge. And in a way, all those things don't matter at the end of the day. You have to like really, you know, bring yourself outside of yourself in order to uh, put yourself out there. That That's a lot of self, but uh, it's true. You know, you have to really uh, kind of have a bird eye view mm. of what's going on in order to understand. Like, you have to, and uh, like literally envision the bird eye view because if you really see yourself as like, okay, this is just the landscape that we're in right now. This is just, you know, I'm just performing for these people. I'm just going to give my best show. And you think of it more that way, more so than, oh, they're going to do this and very specific, like minute things, you know, um, then they're going to experience that with you, right? They're going to experience whatever you're experiencing on stage. If they see that you're nervous, they feel nervous too. And if you want to give off that feeling, go ahead. But, you know, for... <laughs> For me, I wanted to always give the experience of like this joyful playing, this like, you know, um, I, I want it to feel uplifting. I don't want it to feel like kind of, you know, anxious. Or, like, I'm free. I got to play the right notes. We're, yeah, we're, exactly. we're here for me to play the right notes. Ladies right. and gentlemen, thank you for coming out tonight to watch me play <laughs> the right play notes. <laughs> right, right. Like, I didn't want to give off that feeling. I want to give off the feeling like I really express, you know, this is how this is my experience here mm. on earth, you know, sharing. And, yeah. Sharing community the way that, yeah. The way that I love when people share with me, I want people to love it when I share with them, you know, it's the same feeling. Amazing. I think we're going to end it right there. That was perfect. We, <laughs> we started with community yeah. and we ended it. We ended, excuse me, with community. Peter yeah. Lin, thank you so much for coming on everyone you can check out his social media in the podcast description uh also we'll put in links to the drones so you can go practice uh practice with those peter any last words um just hoping that everyone's doing okay you know let's find a way to make this work even uh post pandemic you know let's uh absolutely let's together and make it happen so i really appreciate it dan um you know fantastic um you know interview skills right there man so uh you're doing a fantastic job yeah. it was yeah. so great to talk to you ladies and gentlemen peter lynn